Coming up today, the MERS crisis in Korea takes a turn for the worse as two suspected MERS patients die. Several hundred people are now in isolation as the number of confirmed cases jumps to 25. President Park and Hay says she can't accept a recent revision to the National Assembly Act, which grants Parliament the right to request changes to executive orders. First, Korea and China officially sign their bilateral free trade deal. The agreement will eliminate most tariffs between the two countries over the next 20 years. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello to our viewers around the world at 6am on Tuesday, June 2nd here in Seoul. Thanks as always for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We begin with the latest on the outbreak of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS in Korea. Health authorities here are now on full alert after a suspected MERS patient who died on Monday tested positive for the virus, marking the first lethal case in the current outbreak. The Ministry of Health and Welfare confirmed on Tuesday that the 58-year-old female patient who died of acute respiratory failure at a hospital in Korea's Gyeonggi-do province was confirmed to have had the virus. Doctors say her condition worsened after coming into contact with the nation's first MERS patient when they shared the same hospital in mid-May. Another patient also died from the viral disease overnight. The 71-year-old patient was receiving treatment in an isolation ward after contracting the virus also from the first patient. Now, officials announced six more cases overnight with the uh, MERS virus, raising the total number of confirmed cases to 25. And what's even more concerning is that among the six patients, Two of them have never had any contact with the first patient. Now, in other news, Korea's presidential office has blasted a bill passed by Parliament that gives lawmakers the right to request changes to executive orders. Watchers say the top office's furious reaction to the bill's passage suggests President Park and hae plans to veto it. Our Choi yoo Sun has more. At Monday's meeting of senior secretaries, President Buck said the controversial bill could paralyze her administration's ability to run state affairs. Last Friday, the presidential office urged lawmakers to review the bill, arguing it could violate the constitutional division of powers, including the judicial right to review legislation and executive rights. The new legislation appeared last week with the main opposition party negotiating to link it to the public pension reform bill. The opposition side hopes to use the bill to request revisions to the ordinance concerning an independent probe into the Sewolho ferry disaster. The president's latest remarks indicate she may veto the bill, especially if a request made through it would require mandatory action from the administration. Lawmakers are still at odds on that aspect of the bill. The ruling party's floor leader says it wouldn't require mandatory action and therefore won't violate the constitution. The main opposition party says the bill would require mandatory action, then criticized the president for declaring a war against the legislature. The ball is now in the assembly's court. The rival parties must come to agreement on the extent of bill's power, specifically whether or not a request to change presidential orders is just a recommendation or a directive that requires action by the administration. Choi yoo Sun, Arirang News. Now, staying on the domestic political front and bickering continues over a number of topics slated for the June Extraordinary National Assembly session. For more on the issues expected to top the agenda this month, our National Assembly correspondent Park Ji-won reports. 
The confirmation hearing for Prime Minister nominee Hwang kyo wan is expected to be the priority for the June extraordinary session. Both parties agreed to hold the confirmation hearing starting next Monday. The ruling Senuri party had hoped to follow a conventional process that would only take two days, wrapping up before June 14th when President Park Geun-hye departs on a state visit to the United States. But the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy pushed for more time to thoroughly assess Hwang's credentials. After lengthy discussions, the two parties settled on a three-day confirmation hearing. Follow-up discussions on pension reform and strengthening the national pension system are also likely to cause heated discussions. A bill linked to the controversial pension reform bill for civil servants that was passed last week is now facing severe opposition from the presidential office. This new piece of legislation would allow the National Assembly to request changes to presidential ordinances. Rival camps are split on the matter. The ruling party plans on gathering opinions from lawmakers and legal experts before taking any action. The main opposition party says the presidential office should respect the assembly's decisions. Some 50 economy-related bills, including crowdfunding and service industry acts, may also lead to political wrangling. The Senuri party says they are necessary to boost the economy, but the main opposition party says the bills give unfair benefits and priorities to big conglomerates while stifling small and mid-sized businesses. Park ji Arirang News. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe kicked off its Asia conference Right here in Seoul on Monday, Oh Hang Sang-hee was there and filed this report. Foreign Minister Yun Byung-se called for Asian countries to increase cooperation to tackle security challenges in the region, pointing to Europe's OSCE as a good example. The OSCE's success in building trust through, through confidence and security building measures has important lessons for Northeast Asia. This part of the world lacks trust, as well as a regional multilateral mechanism. With 57 member nations and 11 partner countries, the Organization for Security and Cooperation is the world's largest intergovernmental security body. Yun said the European bloc is an inspiration for the Park Geun-hye administration's so-called Northeast Asian Peace and Cooperation Initiative, or NAPSI. In contrast to that Korea-led initiative, OSCE Secretary General Lamberto Zanier explained the European bloc began with a top-down approach where the nations sat around the table and developed the concept together. Now we're seeing a country taking the lead and developing a concept and then this country has to sell it to the others. Uh, so I think the, the problem is uh, how do you move this forward? While the region is mired in historical and territorial disputes, Zanier said the best way to build trust is a bottom-up approach, focusing on issues like nuclear and cyber security. Uh, so you can start initiatives in these, uh, in these contexts, engaging the countries of, of the region, and then uh, use them as building blocks to develop then the, uh, and, and to, and to uh, implement uh, what in the end will be, will be NAPSI. The visiting OSCE chief added that NAPSI should touch an issue of interest to all countries in the region. Hwang sang Arirang News. Now, North Korea has again refused to participate in the long-stalled six-party talks over its nuclear program, according to the German press agency DPA. North Korea's Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, Gung Sok Ung, made the statement Monday during a meeting with the chairman of the German-Korean parliamentary group, group Hamut Koshik, who was visiting Pyongyang. The North Korean minister reportedly said North Korea will no longer sit at the same negotiating table as the U.S. since it was clear Washington was threatening Pyongyang. The statement comes as South Korea and the U.S. began a massive joint anti-submarine drill to tackle North Korea's threats. South Korea's free trade deal with China is one step closer to implementation as the two sides officially signed their pact on Monday. Once in effect, the FTA will gradually remove tariffs on more than 90% of goods from both countries over the next two decades. Our Guansua reports. 
It's been three years since official negotiations began. Now, more doors will open for trade between Korea and China, 23 years after establishing diplomatic ties. The agreement will deepen and advance economic cooperation between China and South Korea and safeguard important arrangements and guarantees. Korea's Trade Minister Yoon Sang-jik told reporters that the agreement will create a 12 trillion U.S. dollar market and give businesses in both countries immense opportunities for growth. Within 10 years of implementation, the pact will lift import tariffs on almost 80 percent of Korean products to China and more than 70 percent of Chinese products to Korea. Within 20 years, more than 90 percent of tariffs from both sides will be eliminated. This latest pact will extend trade beyond manufacturing and agriculture to include the service, finance and communication sectors. And hopes are that it'll even contribute to peace on the Korean peninsula, as items manufactured at the inter-Korean industrial complex will benefit from tariff reductions too. Unlike other free trade agreements, this deal has a working committee that can discuss building another version of the Kaesong industrial complex. According to a government impact report, the Korea-China FDA is expected to raise Korea's real gross domestic product by 0.96 percent 10 years after implementation and create almost 54,000 new jobs. All that's left now is approval from both countries' legislatures followed by a 60-day period for final adjustments before the pact takes effect, which could happen as early as this year. Kwon Soa. Arirang News. Now, despite the huge opportunities we just heard there that FTA will eventually provide local exporters here in Korea, the situation as it stands right now looks pretty bleak, with Korea's exports dropping by the biggest margin in almost six years last month. Our Kim ji reports. Korea's exports declined for the fifth straight month in May, recording the biggest drop since August of 2009. Compared to last year, overall outbound shipments slipped nearly 11 percent to 42.4 billion U.S. dollars. The trade ministry says it's all due to a slowdown in global trade, fewer working days and lower prices for petrochemical products. 70 countries imported 13 percent less of goods during the January to March period from a year earlier. Their low demand for imports are impacting Korea's export volume. Sluggish exports are being considered as a major stumbling block in the country's road to recovery, given its reliance on external markets for growth. Data by Citigroup research shows Korea's competitiveness in the export market has dipped in general, mainly because of China's technological advancements. It predicts China's tech industry will make big leaps in the next 16 months to be on par with Korea. And fueling further concern is Japan's weakening yen, which is also said to be putting a dent in Korea's price competitiveness as many export items between the two countries overlap. The Korean won was trading at around 894 won against 100 yen, strengthening to a seven-year high as of Monday afternoon. And according to Bloomberg, 22 out of 36 global financial institutions predict the yen will depreciate even further this year, on expectations that Japan will pursue policies to accelerate recovery and lower inflation prices. Kim Jo, Arirang News. Now, reaching a 60th anniversary is a major milestone for any partnership. And this week, to commemorate six decades of cooperation, Korea and the World Bank are holding special events at the World Bank office in Songdo. Our Shin Semin reports. Korea Week kicked off on Monday with an opening speech from the World Bank vice president for the East Asia Pacific region, who applauded Korea's rapid growth. Korea has been at the forefront of innovation and risk-taking, combining efforts of public and private sector actors. Also, let me say that the Koreans' long-term vision and focus on shared prosperity have been an important aspect of its success. The World Bank representative also said Korea's membership furthered the organization's goals of ending poverty and boosting shared prosperity by supporting a number of development projects in low-income countries. 
Currently, Korea is one of 188 member nations, and although the country's contribution rate is just over 1.7 percent, World Bank officials say Korea can bring even more to the table in terms of its development experience. Uh, Korea, because it was a poor country at some point, it speaks with credibility. So for me, what is really interesting is the quality of the knowledge that Korea brings to the table rather than the voting shares. Those sentiments were echoed by World Bank President Kim Young, who sent a video message calling for Korea to take on a larger role and become an inspiration for developing countries. The 60th anniversary milestone is expected to increase cooperation and foster a long-standing partnership between Korea and the World Bank. Events run until Friday and include sessions on topics ranging from climate change to leadership to information and technology. Shin Se-min, Arirang News, Songdo. Now in world news, militants from the Islamic State group have reportedly kidnapped around 500 Iraqi children to use as suicide bombers in Iraq and Syria. A local politician from Iraq's Anbar province told a local news agency that the children, all thought to be under 16 years old, were taken to IS-controlled territory, possibly for training at the group's Cubs of the Caliphate camps for child recruits. The official said he was concerned the kids would be brainwashed into becoming cannon fodder in terror and suicide attacks. Activists have long claimed that IS fighters try to convince children living near Islamic State positions to join the group, often without the approval of their parents. Well, that's all we have for now. Have a wonderful day and thank you as always for watching. Until next time, goodbye.